Tonight, the start of a national inquiry. Did the government need to invoke the Emergencies Act? Are you going to hear any evidence about espionage and sabotage? The answer to that is no. Plus, Rosie's here with that issue. More Iran sanctions from a government under pressure. Against 17 people and three entities. Marketplace undercover. New warnings for some would-be home buyers. There's nothing gray area about it. It is absolutely fraud. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thank you for joining us. Provinces, police, protesters, and the federal government have begun laying out their arguments at a new public inquiry. It is looking at the Liberals' unprecedented use of the Emergencies Act. That move back in February was made to clear out convoy protesters who had gridlocked downtown Ottawa. It gave police extraordinary powers and allowed banks to freeze some finances. It also required that an inquiry be held on a pretty strict timeline. So that began today, and testimony will stretch on for the next six weeks. Rafi Bujikanian looks at the positions already being made clear. After three weeks of little action, back in February, Ottawa police finally moved in. The convoy protest was ending. The Emergencies Act was in force. How and why the powers in the Act were invoked are matters of great public interest. And so a public inquiry has begun and battle lines have been drawn. The federal government is seeking to justify its actions. Given these unprecedented illegal protests, uh, we needed to take action. But a string of others say that move went too far. Provinces like Alberta point out authorities stopped a border blockade there without extra legislation. None of the powers that were created under the Federal Emergencies Act were necessary. A lawyer for some of the protesters said the act simply wasn't needed. It could be invoked due to espionage and sabotage. Are you going to hear any evidence about espionage and sabotage? The answer to that is no. Are you going to hear evidence of violence against persons or property? The answer is no. Downtown residents and business owners have a list of grievances. The impact on Ottawa for those three weeks of harassment, street blockages, ear-splitting air and train horns, and general lawlessness was unprecedented. The police response will also be front and centre. The police had little time to prepare. The genesis of the protest had only begun a couple of weeks before it arrived in town. After some delay, you will hear that the OPP took on a leadership role in coordinating resources from different police services. Rafi, so we hear there from a lot of lawyers, but we will also clearly hear from a lot of witnesses. 65 different witnesses, Adrian, including Trudeau and seven members of his cabinet, the former and current Ottawa police chiefs, the commissioners of the RCMP and the Ontario Provincial Police, as well as some protest organizers, including Pat King and Tamara Leach. And how tight is the timeline on this? Witness testimony is supposed to wrap in six weeks and the whole process has to be done by law in February. Thousands of documents are expected to be released. The inquiry commissioner already hinting that that's a lot of work in little time. No kidding. All right, Rafi Bujikani in, in Ottawa. Thanks, Rafi. You're welcome. And we'll continue this conversation ahead. Rosie and the Ad Issue crew are here tonight. This is on their radar. We'll get their take in about 20 minutes. So a day of hearings in Washington as well with new evidence from the January 6th committee. As Paul Hunter shows us, lawmakers are now aiming at the very top of the former administration. If the fury, violence and confusion of that day hadn't already been drilled into the minds of Americans in previous hearings, more remarkable fly-on-the-wall video today from behind the scenes as rioters rampaged on Capitol Hill. And now apparently everybody on the floor is putting on tear gas masks to prepare for a breach. Well, I'm trying to get more information. They're putting on their tear gas masks. 
Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, seemingly dumbfounded by what was playing out that day. And later, along with New York Senator Chuck Schumer, enraged on a flip phone with Donald Trump's then acting attorney general. Yeah, why don't you get the president to tell them to leave the Capitol, Mr. Attorney General, in your law enforcement responsibility? This committee started... All of it played back in what was billed as the January 6th committee's final hearing, along with excerpts from freshly obtained Secret Service emails signaling Trump's own security team knew full well the demonstrators were armed that day and planning violence. With the committee underlining, Trump urged demonstrators toward that regardless in his efforts to overturn results of the 2020 election. The central cause of January 6th was one man, Donald Trump, whom many others followed. None of this would have happened without him. But it was at the end of today's hearing, the committee dropped its bombshell. So we want to hear from him. Chairman Benny Thompson calling for a vote to now subpoena Donald Trump himself. A subpoena to a former president is a serious and extraordinary action. That's why we want to take this step in full view of the American people. Those and in full aye. view, they voted. Aye. The result, unanimous. Mr. Chairman, on this vote, there are nine ayes and zero noes. And Paul, I mean, Donald Trump has already responded. How worried should he actually be about this? Yeah, he immediately slammed the committee for doing this so late in the game, but he did not say whether he would or would not comply. To be clear, to not comply is a crime and risks jail time, so he should be worried. But time's a ticking on the committee, right? It wants to issue its findings on all this next month, and mm -hmm. Trump might be able to find a way to punt and delay until it all becomes moot. Or there's another option. He could show up and plead the fifth, as they say, and not answer questions and self-incriminate, though... As Trump himself has said before, the only people who do that are those with something to hide, Adrian. All right, Paul, thank you. The gunman in the deadliest school shooting in Florida history has avoided the death penalty. Instead, Parkland shooter Nicholas Cruz will spend the rest of his life behind bars. Adjudicated of 17 counts of murder in the first degree, the jury having returned a verdict of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. After a three-month trial, the jury decided against recommending the death penalty today due to mitigating factors, they said, including lifelong mental health issues. The jurors' call prompted outrage from several families. This should have been the death penalty, 100%. I pray that that animal suffers every day of his life in jail. I don't know how this jury came to the conclusions that they did today. Nicholas Cruz killed 14 students and three staff members at Stoneman Douglas High School in November of 2018. He will be formally sentenced on November the 1st. Now, Ottawa has announced new sanctions against members of the Iranian government. Ashley Burke shows us how the government is responding to critics who want it to go so much further. The pressure has been mounting for weeks, from protests of support in Canadian streets to anger from loved ones of those killed when Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps shot down flight PS752. Accusing the government of allowing Canada to be a safe haven for the regime's relatives. What we need is just a war. What we need is action now. Is the IRGC a terrorist group? Yes or no? A question repeated over and over from the Conservatives in the House. They have not done so. Why? For the first time, the government explained clearly why it won't list it as a terrorist entity, because it fears innocent Iranians could be impacted. Military service is mandatory for many Iranians, including those who do not support the regime. Which is a very valid argument. I fully agree with it. But what he didn't add was... Even if we wanted to do that, we couldn't. We just don't have the resources. Instead, the government says it will pursue an Immigration Act designation that would make top members of the Iranian regime inadmissible to Canada and potentially kick their families out. When someone is deemed inadmissible as a result of their connection to the regime, uh, their family members uh, can be deemed inadmissible as well. 
The government also announced more sanctions. Sanctions against 17 people and three entities. That includes the prosecutor, Saeed Mortazavi, who ordered the torture of Iranian Canadian journalist Zara Kazemi, who died 19 years ago. As for his plan to use the Immigration Act, the government confirms that it has not yet collected the evidence needed to do this. But the public safety minister said that the Canada Border Services Agency is working on it and that he's confident that with Iran's track record of human rights violations, it will happen. The question now is, how long could it take? Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Turning to the war in Ukraine now, where Ukrainian forces are still on the offensive and Russia appears to be playing for time. Grinding combat just isn't going Russia's way. Geolocated images show Ukraine advancing in the east towards Russian trenches. At the NATO summit, one key focus was bolstering Ukraine in the winter. We will stand by Ukraine for as long as it takes. Another focus countering Russia's nuclear threats. Any nuclear attack against Ukraine will uh, create an answer. Not a nuclear answer, but a, such a powerful answer from the military side that the Russian army will be inoculated. But Putin has other ways of testing Western resolve. He proposed turning NATO member Turkey into a new hub for Russian gas. With a hard winter coming, the rest of Europe is scrambling for supply. And winter in Ukraine will be a grueling test of endurance. That country's forces need not just weapons, but training to bring skilled soldiers to the front. And Chris Brown saw Canada's contribution to that firsthand. The guns and ammunition are real, but these Ukrainian soldiers are far from the battlefields near their homes. Come on, come on, come on. This is southern England on a British military base, where British, Canadian and other allies are training Ukrainian recruits in the skills they need to survive and go on the offensive against Vladimir Putin's army. There's definitely a sense of... A purpose and a sense of urgency. Major Mike Powell commands the roughly 160 Canadian military trainers here. What I noticed about the courses that ran uh, throughout the summer was there was a, a real focus on defensive operations and where we're now uh, trying really hard to instill in the candidates um, what I'll call a, an offensive spirit or a patrolling spirit. In southern Ukraine, near Kherson and in eastern Donbass, Ukraine's army has been methodically regaining territory occupied by Russia. This scenario is meant to simulate just a small part of what the recruits will experience with the noise and chaos of an assault on the enemy. This live fire exercise is the culmination of five weeks of basic training. Within days, these troops will be going back to Ukraine, some straight to the front lines. Perhaps the biggest difference between getting trained here and in Ukraine is safety, says this soldier who goes by the name Panda. Until a few weeks ago, he worked as a design engineer in western Ukraine. We don't hear any siren on early morning, don't uh, missile, don't uh, get in our trench or buildings, and we concentrate on our training. The recruits will leave here trained in weapons, in basic tactics and how to treat combat wounds in the field, which was the goal of this simulation. You know, at every opportunity, they always want to know more. They always want to have further training. They want to do more repetitions, and it's all about building up that confidence. 5,000 Ukrainian soldiers have already gone through the program, and officers here say the goal is to get 20,000 new soldiers trained up and made as lethal as possible. Chris Brown, CBC News, in southern England. Canada's Minister of Immigration is calling for a crackdown on Canadian career colleges. This follows a fifth estate investigation showing how some international students are lured to Canada. Here's Mark Kelly. Take it, Daddy. 19-year-old Dilpreet Kaur talks to her father in India to let him know how she's making out at a career college in Toronto. He's a farmer who sold two trucks to raise the $28,000 to send her to Canada. But a year in, she says her education feels more like a cash grab. They just want us to give money and like again and again and get rich, filling their pockets and don't really care about us at all. International students pay as much as five times the tuition Canadian students pay. Most come from India. The average Punjabi family will have to 
work 74 years to pay one year's of tuition. So why sacrifice so much? It starts with recruitment agents in India. We took a hidden camera to listen in to the promises and the deception that goes on behind closed doors. We heard agents direct students to little-known career colleges in suburban strip malls who pay recruiters up to $2,000 for every enrollment. In some cases, students are told their two-year diploma will get them a high-paying office job anywhere in Canada and permanent residency, promises they can't make. The system is built on uh, misinformation. The focus has been numbers-driven, numbers, 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 and that's all, literally, that anyone cares about. Some colleges now get more money from international students than government funding. Ontario has seen a 342% growth in international student enrollments, especially at small career colleges. There are certain private career colleges that I'm convinced have come to exist just to make a buck on the back of the international student program. It's completely unacceptable to me. Fraser says provinces need to put more pressure on colleges to better regulate those recruiters and insist on a higher quality of education so many parents are mortgaging their future for. Mark Kelly, CBC News, Toronto. And you can watch the full story on this investigation and others by the Fifth Estate by going on CBC Gem, our free streaming service. We are learning more about Tuesday's fatal shooting of two Ontario police officers. Ontario's Special Investigations Unit says Devin Northrup and Morgan Russell had not drawn their weapons when they were shot at at a residence in Innisfil, Ontario. A third officer exchanged gunfire with Christopher Joseph Doncaster, who had a semi-automatic rifle. Doncaster died at the scene. His autopsy is set for tomorrow. Now, there was some vigorous reaction today to a CBC News investigation into the ancestry of prominent lawyer Mary Ellen Turpel Lafont. Sam Sampson walks us through some of it. A scholar, judge, advocate. I want to tell you why I feel this agreement is very important for the Aboriginal peoples of Canada. Now, at the centre of controversy, Mary Ellen Turpel Lafont says she is a treaty Indian, that her father was Cree. But historical records shown in a CBC News investigation suggest her father was born to a white European couple. It hurts. Métis lawyer Jean Taye has written on Indigenous identity and has investigated others' backgrounds. They are taking the space up that was meant for Indigenous people. Could um, they have done this excellent work without taking on red face? Absolutely. Trapel Lafond has been accepted as a member of Muskeg Lake Cree Nation, her husband's First Nation in Saskatchewan, for almost 30 years. But some say that's not the issue. You can be a member. That doesn't mean you're Indigenous, though. It just means you're a member of that First Nation. We, you could be a white woman who marries an Indigenous man. But today, others are standing behind Trapel Lafond. She has made absolutely stunning contributions to the advancement of all Indigenous peoples in this country. We value her based on her work and her results. The University of British Columbia, which employs Trapella Fond, says it relies on self-declaration when hiring. But other schools are working on alternatives, and some say to avoid doubt, demand verification. Can't open a bank account without an ID. You can't do any, you can't get employed without showing the university your ID. They want my social insurance number. I mean, why not? Does Indigenous governance not matter? Does it not count? Turpel Lafond declined an interview. She says CBC's questions about her ancestry are offensive and an invasion of her privacy. Sam Sampson, CBC News, Regina. An undercover CBC Marketplace investigation is exposing a growing problem in this country. Some networks of brokers and real estate agents committing mortgage fraud for a fee. It's putting would-be homeowners at risk. David Common shows us the pitch and the price those buyers could pay. So here's okay. the mic. Marketplace sent this undercover team to investigate mortgage fraud. What they found was real estate agents illegally offering fake documents to help buyers fraudulently qualify for a mortgage. Income is not issue because income he can make. They will make T4. Hmm. They will make like he's on the payroll. They're pitching fake jobs and fake salaries, charging buyers thousands of dollars. If these deals go through, the agents would make big commissions. The buyers 
could be in jeopardy. If you are making zero dollar, even if you are a housewife, we can make the income. That's what they charge one percent of the mortgage. So they charge one percent of the mortgage. The mortgage. Uh, there's nothing gray area about it. It is absolutely fraud. Wow. Mortgage agent Sanjit Man says he hears about fraudulent operators all the time. He says new immigrants are often the target and have the most to lose if they buy a house they can't afford. If you get blacklisted by the banks, well now think about this. You're building a life here in a new country. You're blacklisted by the banks. What's that going to mean for the rest of your life? At this house, bought for a million dollars, these newcomers were told by their agent not to seek mortgage pre-approval that he had a plan. He can do any paperwork and make us qualify for more mortgage. When they refused his fraudulent approach, they lost the house and their $40,000 deposit. It's, it's been tough. It's been really tough. Mortgage fraud can have lifelong consequences. It is a criminal offense. Pushing someone else to use fake documents is illegal too. The regulator says it will investigate evidence of wrongdoing, but it does not conduct undercover tests, as our team did. David Common, CBC News, Brampton, Ontario. And you can catch the full hidden camera investigation with details on how mortgage fraud might impact you tomorrow night on Marketplace at 8 p.m., 8.30 in Newfoundland on CBC TV and CBC Gem. A fight is brewing between Atlantic Canada's fishing industry and those trying to protect an endangered species of whale. To be honest, I don't know anyone who's seen a right whale in this community. Why some fishermen say they are being unfairly targeted. Next. With Danielle Smith, Alberta's new premier, the Sovereignty Act is boiling on the political front burner. We are vigorously going to defend every area of our, our Thanks, constitutional Steve. jurisdiction. Coming up, is the Constitution coming back into the headlines? Rosie and the Ad Issue panel will dive into that. And a little later, an Indigenous community gets rolling. Why their new skate park has been well worth the wait. We're back in two. There's been a big loss for Canadian cinema. Mi'kmaq filmmaker Jeff Barnaby has died. Best known for his critically acclaimed films, Rhymes for Young Ghouls and Blood Quantum, Barnaby is being remembered as a visionary committed to telling Indigenous stories. The award-winning writer-director was from the Listigouge Reserve in Quebec, but lived in Montreal. Representatives of Barnaby say he died of cancer. He was just 46 years old. Canada's fishing industry is fighting back against a shellfish boycott initiated by a California environmental group. So Seafood Watch has red-listed Atlantic lobster and snow crab, saying the way they're harvested is harmful to endangered right whales. Chris O'Neill Yates explains. Dead North Atlantic right whales in eastern Canadian waters have become an all-too-familiar scene. Just 350 remain worldwide. And since 2017, 10% have been killed. This is an animal that's on a trajectory to towards extinction. Kim Elmsley says right whales can become entangled in fishing gear. It's almost a perfect storm in that you have this highly endangered species as well as it's such an important fishing area. Bernard Martin has fished for 50 years. To be honest, I don't know anyone who's seen a right whale in this community. Right whales are rare in Newfoundland waters. Entanglements and boat collisions are more common in the Gulf of St. Lawrence and in U.S. waters. Yet catches from Maine to Newfoundland are all lumped together in this red alert. The last right whale entanglement on record off Newfoundland was in 1984 in cod gear that's no longer used. We've been called up to the Maritimes to work on them because they had no one else up there to do that. And, uh, but we've never worked on any, any, any of these animals here. It's kind of a bazooka approach. So the harvesters in Newfoundland who's never, who've never seen a whale are, are put in the same boat as the, as the harvesters in the Gulf who are seeing them now. Irvine says ropeless gear and closing fisheries when right whales are sighted, along with other measures, have been developed to minimize the impact on right whales all throughout Atlantic Canada. I think the right approach is to work with fishermen, work with people who are on the front lines. 
we have to have a balance. We're not going to shut down the, the lobster and the crab fishery in Canada. As for Seafood Watch, we reached out to ask about the reasoning behind including Atlantic lobster and snow crab on their red list. They have not responded. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, St. John's. And after the break, Rosie's here with that issue. Hey, Adrian, tonight we're going to talk about the message that some premiers, some Western premiers, are sending to Ottawa. We are vigorously going to defend every area of our, our Thanks, constitutional Steve. jurisdiction. What this push for more provincial autonomy could mean for the federal government, Chantal, Elamine, Althea, and Andrew will join me to talk about that and more. Hi there, I'm Rosemary Barton. Here's what's at issue this week. Alberta Premier Danielle Smith dialed back her pledge on her proposed Sovereignty Act. When things get decided by the Supreme Court, that we will abide by the decision of the Supreme Court. But you bet, we're up, up until that point, we are vigorously going to defend every area of our, our Thanks, constitutional Steve. jurisdiction. But that fight over jurisdictions is also brewing in Saskatchewan, where Premier Scott Moe unveiled his own plan to defend his province's economic autonomy this week. Two provinces sending a message to Ottawa. My focus is what it has always been, on working with premiers across the country to deliver the best results for Canadians. Canadians in their priorities. So tonight we are asking, are we headed towards a constitutional fight? And what do these challenges to Ottawa mean for the federal government? So let's bring in at issue Chantal Hébert, Elamine Abdul-Mahmoud, Althea Raj and Andrew Coyne. Good to see everyone. Uh, Althea, I'm going to start with you this week. Certainly the, the new Premier of Alberta hasn't completely walked back from uh, the Sovereignty Act. We'll also have to see what the legislation says. But she does seem to now say that she will kind of generally follow the guidance of the Supreme Court. How, how are you interpreting um, her approach to, to Ottawa in these first few days? I think it's a welcome step back. I'm sure some of her supporters are probably going to be disappointed. But I think up until those clarifying remarks, there was a real concern that Danielle Smith was going to be um, disrespecting the rule of law and kind of the uh, system upon which our federation is based. Uh, so I think that that's a good sign. Um, I think what we are seeing, to answer kind of the, the greater theme of the question, is maybe not so much a constitutional crisis, but kind of we're sleepwalking towards a federalism crisis. And it's not just Scott Moe and Daniel Smith in the Western provinces who, to be fair, we don't really know what they are going to bring forward. We don't know what the Sovereignty Act is going to look like. Um, but also in Quebec with François Legault, the premier of Quebec, who is is really with bills, Bill 21 and Bill 96, which we have talked a lot about on this program, um, are, are, are challenging uh, norms that we have in this country about not using the notwithstanding clause preemptively, about unilaterally amending the Constitution, which is what Bill 96 does. And I think all of these things uh, added together really paint a picture of federalism and crisis in this country. I can see Chantal wants in. So Chantal, then uh, I'll come to the other two. Maybe because I live in a place where uh, saber wrestling is uh, the background noise. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, we are sleepwalking to a crisis. Uh, yes, the use of the notwithstanding clause preemptively is new. And I, like others, uh, I'm curious to see what the Supreme Court has to say about it and how much trouble uh, it brings or doesn't bring to the Quebec government. But otherwise, I mean... In this province, if you called the bill the Sovereignty Act, the government would lose more than half of the support that it needs. <laughs> so, and so far, uh, these uh, discussions uh, have mostly amounted to grandstanding to win votes uh, that get resolved in a very boring fashion. So, yeah. yeah it's I, but, but it is interesting. But I do believe that it's part of what a federation is, that uh, provinces kick the tires. Yeah. And I'll just remind people that the last time the provinces, many of them got together, was to challenge the carbon tax. And what happened as a result of that was the, the power of the federal government to actually oversee how we deal with climate. And climate change was reaffirmed by the Supreme Court. So if you're yeah. going to pick a battle, you may... Uh, lose the war if you don't pick the right one. 
When I, uh, when I talked to Danielle Smith over the weekend, one of the things she talked about, Andrew, was how Alberta didn't want to be the, the junior partner, um, which was is maybe something she feels and Alberta feels, but it's not something I see reflected here um, in Ottawa, certainly. And it's not any re reflection of reality. Uh, everyone acknowledges that both the federal government and the provinces have jurisdictional responsibilities under the Constitution. And when the federal government exercises its, its jurisdiction, it is not making a province a junior partner. It's simply exercising its jurisdiction. So there's a kind of a, 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 a doctrine in some of the provinces that anytime the feds do anything, they're somehow treading on provincial toes. And mm -hmm. I'm sorry, that's not the case. Now, look, there's a difference between a, a, a constitutional argument and a constitutional crisis. It's perfectly acceptable for provinces and the federal government to fight over who has what responsibility and argue about it and, and take each other to court over it. That's fine. <clears throat> What's not acceptable is for provinces and provincial governments to announce that they're not going to obey the law, they're not going to be bound by uh, court rulings, et cetera. And if you read the Free Alberta Strategy, which is what the Alberta Sovereignty Act is based on, and remember one of the authors of that strategy was Danielle Smith's campaign chair, uh, it, it's quite explicit in saying we're not going to obey federal laws, we're not going to be bound by federal courts, we're going to replace federal judges with provincially appointed judges, we're going to divert uh, federal taxes uh, into provincial coffers. And one of the authors was quite explicit in saying, yeah, the point of this is to bring on a constitutional crisis. Right. So we'll have to see whether, in fact, Danielle Smith is truly going to walk this back. It's certainly a step in the right direction to say she'll be bound by a Supreme Court decision. And if that is true, uh, I think one of the first things that would happen if they bring in this act that was as, as it was originally envisaged is the Supreme Court would rule it as, as being completely unconstitutional, in which case maybe that's what she wants. She can, she can tell her, her supporters, well, I tried, uh, and then she can still live within the rule of law. But we've got a lot of uh, uh, issues still to be resolved in this till we, till we see whether we're out of the woods on this or not. And, and when you see someone like Scott Moe sort of jumping on the bandwagon, Elamine, does it then become really about premiers looking for uh, a punching bag, and that punching bag is a convenient liberal federal government? Sure. I mean, we certainly have to. There's a necessity of sort of differentiating between normal federalism tensions and abnormal federalism tensions. Um, this country is founded on federalism tensions. That's just what we do around right here. <laughs> uh, I think like when we sort of look at what makes this moment unique, um, one of the things that does actually make this moment extraordinary is the involvement of Francois Legault um, in, in Quebec. And um, I actually disagree with Chantal uh, about the idea of it being saber rattling because, you know, Bill 21 and Bill 96, I think, explicitly are not saber rattling. I think they, they sort of um, elevate the, 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 the sort of, at least the constitutional conversation, the idea that Quebec is able to amend the constitution um, and have the prime minister say, you know what, they are allowed to do this, even though there are plenty of constitutional experts to say, actually, that is not permitted to do so. Um, I think that is worrying. I think it also kind of dovetails worryingly with this kind of rise of retail politics, where you have a lot of federal politicians um, who are reluctant to defend federalism uh, locally, whether it's in Alberta or Quebec, um, because, you know, that sort of guarantees them a little bit more uh, mm -hmm. votes the next time around. And I think one thing that we have to maybe ask ourselves is, is this federal government particularly concerned with the unity crisis at this moment? Um, and if, you know, if they do find themselves in the middle of one, how will they be responding to late? And I think the answer is already okay, let's yeah. late. I'll, I'll let, let Chantal respond then, Althea. I've seen unity crisis, and this is not what it is. Uh, as for the uh, unilateral amendment of Quebec's internal constitution, I'm okay. content enough to uh, wait to see if Someone challenges it, uh, and I am reminded that someone uh, did challenge New Brunswick's right to agree with Ottawa that it was a bilingual province on the same basis and the same arguments, uh, and they were uh, told by the Supreme Court to go back home. So I'm with Andrew on one point here. Uh, no government in this country at this point has yet said, if the Supreme Court tells us something, we will yeah. disregard it. Uh, beyond that, we have seen those challenges before. Bill 21, Bill 96 are protected by a clause that is in the Constitution. You can like it, you can dislike it, you can question its use, but at the end of the day, so far, it's part of the constitutional process. Should, should the federal government be doing something more to, to Elamine's point, Althea? Because to date, the way the Prime Minister is responding to this is saying, we'll work with provinces, we're here to help Canadians uh, about the things that they're worried about right now. Yeah, I think that's the core question. Um, so far, the federal government has said a few things. 
On Bill 96, finally, the justice minister in the spring said if it came to the Supreme Court, the government would intervene. On Bill 96, uh, the clause amending you, the part of the Constitution that deals with Quebec, the prime minister said he felt, despite the fact that most constitutional scholars outside of Quebec feel that that was not uh, abiding by the Constitution <clears throat> whatsoever, that Parliament should have weighed in. Justin Trudeau said that was fine, which I think is an interesting precedent to set for any other provinces that want, want to amend part of the constitution that deals with them. Yeah. Um, and with regards to the rule of law, the example that Andrew was giving about um, you know, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, all saying that they're not going to ask their police force to uh, enforce part of the criminal code that deals with the buyback program or a federal law. Um, Minister Mendocino just said, well, we, you know, trust the police to follow the law. Um, I think what we're seeing, frankly, is that the federal government has vacated the space and the space has been filled with uh, the forces of decentralization in Alberta, in Saskatchewan, during the equalization referendum in Alberta. There was no federal voice in that debate. The federal government has been basically absent in Quebec. It's starting to get little by little. But what we're seeing is the more you give to the provinces, the more they want. And at yeah. some point, I feel like the federal government needs to defend the idea of a federal government and the federation as a whole. And we are we have yeah. not really seen that from this. Government. Oh, OK. Uh, about can, the sequel of the quickly. referendum. Yeah. Uh, Quick, quickly, Chantel, uh, then, Andrew, can, quickly. No, but it was a year ago. When, when did anything happen as a result of it? Uh, and <laughs> the federal government doesn't give to the provinces. The Constitution does. Andrew? Can I just say that I agree with um, uh, Althea on this but particular point about the Constitution is not just about the text in it, but the norms and understandings around it, and particularly on this matter, the notwithstanding clause. You know, the courts always talk about the Confederation bargain. What was the understanding at the time of Confederation? And there was a bargain struck in the 1982 process as well, which was that we'd have a Charter of Rights, but we'd have this notwithstanding clause that would be used extremely sparingly and rarely in basically crisis or emergency situations. It was not the understanding at the time, and people who were there at the time will tell you this, that it would be used routinely, preemptively, uh, uh, comprehensively to just basically exempt whole swaths of legislation uh, from the reach of the Charter. And the more that this gets normalized, the more that we're basically yeah. eviscerating the Charter and eviscerating the understanding of the Okay, very, very quickly, Chantal, uh, okay, then Elamine, okay, then I'm done. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that is all true, except that Quebec wasn't in the room. That is also true. Elamine, last that's point, that's and then that's I'm going. That's going. That's <laughs> <very> <laughs> witnessing the norms around the notwithstanding clause kind of being shattered as we speak, right? Like, we, it's been used, what, five times in the last just four years or so? Um, that's a pretty extraordinary case, and I think it, yeah. it behooves us as a nation to talk about whether this was its intended use or whether we found ourselves in entirely new territory that actually does, um, in a meaningful way, threaten federalism. See how much we love talking about the Federation <laughs> and the Constitution? That's what we do. We're Canadian. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back with another round of that issue. The public inquiry into the use of the Emergencies Act began today. We'll look at what the fallout could mean. That's next on The National. Hey, welcome back to another round of that issue. The public inquiry into the use of the Emergencies Act started today. We didn't enter uh, into using the Emergencies Act lightly. We used it uh, with a sense of uh, it was the necessary tool at the time. Uh, we used it in a way that was measured and proportionate. That unprecedented decision will be examined closely over the next number of weeks. 65 witnesses, including the Prime Minister, tonight were asking who has the most to potentially lose. What's at stake for the government or the official opposition? Let's bring back at issue Chantal, Elamine, Althea and Andrew. We're just going to do a quick go around here because you spent so much time talking about the Constitution. But we'll come back to this because it is ongoing until November. Um, Elamine, why don't I start with you here? This is, the government says, this is what they want. They want this. It has to happen. Obviously, it's required, but the government says it's open to this happening and it wants to see this um, happening transparently. Is there a risk, though, here for the government? Of course. I mean, like when we sort of see all the opening statements today, uh, one of the elements of the conversation has been 
uh, all the passing of the blame to different levels, right? Um, every single every single lawyer who spoke is saying, you know, you'll see that my clients, the OPP did the right thing, but maybe the Ottawa police, they have their own concern. Um, the Ottawa police, you know, speaks up and says, oh, this might be an RCMP matter. There's, there's a lot of passing of the buck, and I think my worry becomes that as we sort of go through these six weeks, uh, Canadians might get like a front row seat to a show that they didn't want to really want to see, which is how many different levels of government either failed or didn't want to take enough responsibility in the matter. Yeah. Um, and I think that is a risk for not just the federal government, but a lot of you know public institutions that at least for now enjoy some kind of public trust. Andrew, remember that this is not a court of law; it's mostly about the court of public opinion. So. Everyone's expecting the uh, inquiry to make some finding about whether or not the government met the legal standard here of, of necessity, and it may or may not get into the weeds of that. I mean, you've got to be careful not to tread on the um, other legal proceedings that are going on around this. That's right. uh, and the, the, what the public may judge is, if a lot of testimony comes out here that a lot of bad stuff was happening and some pretty bad guys were involved and the Emergency Act made it go away, the public may be more affected by that than by the specific question of, well, did you meet the, the actual threshold of necessity? So I think there's risk on the government side that it can, it can look like it came off half-cocked and, and didn't do its homework on this. But there's also risk for people who associate themselves too closely with the convoy, and I'm talking about the federal conservatives. Uh, Althea. Yeah, I agree. I think there's it's too early to tell which way things are going to go, but uh, there is the risk on both sides. Just today, uh, we learned that the you know the they were supposed to, the federal government is supposed to consult as per the letter of the law, and it seems like consulting with Alberta and Saskatchewan was really just calling them to letting them to let them know that they had made the decision to invoke the Emergencies Act. So that doesn't seem like it meets the threshold. Um, so we in the media will be making those claims, uh, but I. I don't um, I don't really think that we know enough yet to judge what has happened. And I'm surprised that there are some people that you would think might be involved in the proceedings that are not like uh, Doug Ford or anybody political in the Ford government has is not being called. Um, that's interesting to me. While there is a, a large number of federal cabinet ministers that will be testifying. So th that's interesting. Um, and I think we can also what will also be interesting is compare and contrast what it has come out of the House of Commons proceedings and the joint committee with the Senate about, you know, who asked for this. That was the big question we were talking about in the spring. Um, you, will we have the answers that we were missing from that inquiry in this inquiry? Chantal. I'll go back to the court of public opinion that uh, Andrew was talking about. Suppose, worst case scenario, the judge says the legal standard wasn't met after having heard about all this. Yeah. Um, does Pierre Poilievre really want to spend a lot of time in the House of Commons reminding people that he brought donuts to the convoy in the court of public opinion? So I think the risks are at best even and possibly uh, tilted uh, towards uh, the conservatives on this one. At very least, it may, it may include recommendations at the end that make it um, different or improve it if it ever has to be used again. But who knows if that'll ever happen. Okay, thank you all. That was a very good conversation on both topics. We'll revisit this one. I appreciate it. That's Chantal, Althea, uh, Andrew, and Elamine. And now let's throw things back to Adrian in Toronto. Thank you, my friend. Coming up, a little girl's long-awaited first ride. And once I go down that ramp, it makes me go up that ramp. Look at her go. How a new Indigenous skate park is making some dreams come true in our moment. Milani Arquette is a very patient girl. So she got a skateboard last Christmas, and ever since then, she has been calmly waiting for her community's new skate park to open. So patients rewarded. The Mohawk Council of Aquasasne opened the park earlier this week, and Milani's first ride is our moment. We were just out Christmas shopping, and he's like, we should get her a skateboard. So we got her one. She opened it, and she was just super excited. And then I came across the social media posts about the Akwesasne skate park. The grand opening was, was one of the best days of my professional career. So now we have this world-class uh, skate park uh, on the river in our community. So there's over 300 people at the grand opening. It was just really magnificent to see it. 
and she was like the first one that wanted to go on it instantly right away like she was ready to go my leg going down the tall ramp and once i go down that ramp it makes me go up that ramp they designed at least one unique obstacle per skate park what obstacle should we have made for your community turtle has uh, you know it's very representative uh, to our to our people, it's, it's a very important symbol. It's really a dream come true. That's amazing. So uh, there are 15 obstacles, 9,600 square feet. And Milani, uh, I know you're very patient, but if you wait on a little bit longer, it looks like they're going to try to put a dome over that skate park for winter. That is a national for October the 13th. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.